Tom Chaim, The World Before Us, The New Science Behind Our Human Origins. Chapter, Our Genetic Legacy. To know ourselves and to work out where we came from, we must know our ancestry. We are now able to probe the genomes of more and more living humans and compare them against the increasing trickle of new Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes to explore our most ancient genetic history. What did we inherit genetically? Did the genes in us today bring positive benefits or were their negative implications too? We are the very beginning of knowing which of our genes derive from our ancient cousin and what their functions was. High quality medical records, including high coverage genomes from patients who agree to share their genetic and personal data, form the basis for scientific interrogation of large public health databases. Through this work, we can begin to link genes to phenotypes and so place our ancient genetic legacy in our context. I remember well one of the key dates at the start of this new era of genetic archaeology and analysis. In June 2013, David Reich gave a lecture on his recent research to a packed audience at the Oxford Center for Human Genetics. I had to cycle up the steep Headington Hill to reach the venue, which shows how keen I was to attend. Reich had been a doctoral student in zoology at Oxford University, and he gave a fascinating insight in the DNA of Neanderthals and Denisovans. Later that day, he and his host, Professor Sir Peter Donnelly, had a very important conversation. Donnelly was working at the time with UK Biobank, UKB project, huge research initiative aiming to use genetics to tackle wide range of illnesses, including cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and depression. The UKB, UK Biobank, uh, studies a huge group of around 500,000 people, ranging in age from 40 to 69. It is one of the most valuable studies of human health in the world because of the range and breadth of the data that it collects. As well as DNA results, samples of blood, urine and saliva have been taken along with detailed information about the daily lives of the subjects involved, sourced from extensive questionnaires and clinical evaluations. Through this, we know about all aspects of the lives of UKB participants from their diet disease history, their response to sunburn, the average length of time they use a mobile phone, aspects of their mental health, sexual history, insomnia, visual acuity, skin tone, and more. This means that information linking the genomes of the people to their phenotypes, the ways in which these genes are expressed in the environment, can be explored. Someone brilliantly, the study group have agreed to make all of their data available to scientists. So many hundreds of phenotypes are available to be compared and more are being added all the time. Donnelly had been working on designing chips to screen and identify genes that he had he was interested in exploring within this dataset. He asked Reich 
if he would be interested in adding some Neanderthal specific alleles to a custom built chip so that they could uh, search the UKB dataset for them. Reich was extremely excited about the opportunity to be involved and later he sent information about 6000 Neanderthal alleles to Danelli to include in the analysis. The first published analysis work was undertaken by Michael Donneman and Janet Kelso at Max Planck in Leipzig, found interesting and statistically significant patterns in the relationship between Neanderthal derived alleles and phenotypes in UKB. More than half of the traits associated with Neanderthal DNA that initially registered as significant were related to hair and skin biology. Previous studies had obtained evidence purporting to a link Neanderthals with red hair, but no link between Neanderthal DNA and red hair could be found in UKB genome data, suggesting that perhaps it was rare or at very low frequency amongst Neanderthals. They also found that Neanderthal DNA was found in over 60% of people near a gene called BNC2 and that individuals in the UKB who carried Neanderthal DNA reported high incidences of childhood sunburn and poor tanning ability typical of those with fair skin. Interestingly, other segments of Neanderthal DNA in the UKB individuals were associated with more olive skin tones, suggesting there may be a variation among the wider Neanderthal population in skin and hair color. Given the high number of archaic alleles associated with skin and hair color, perhaps our human hom Homo sapiens and ancestors benefit from aspects of this Neanderthal's adapted traits, and it was advantages for them after genetic interrogation with Neanderthals had occurred. Do you know people who describe themselves as morning person? Perhaps you are more of an evening person, or perhaps something in between. We call these categories chronotypes, and it turns out these have a strong genetic basis. There are four categories in the UKB datasets. Quote, definitely an evening person, more evening than a morning person, more morning person than evening person, and definitely morning person, end quote. The UKB comparison revealed that Neanderthal alleles associated with genes ASB1 and AXOC6 strongly associated with these preferences. What is interesting is that there is a significant association between latitude and these chronotypes. The farther you are from equator, the greater the chance you have the Neanderthal allele at ASB1. Your preference for being a morning person appears to be increased by having Neanderthal allele variant. I am a definitely morning person. My DNA, as undertaken by US biotechnology company 23andMe, suggests this too, with a predicted average wake-up time 7.05 am. Most of this book was written between 5.30 and 8.30 am, a period when I am most wide awake and alert. Chronotype is linked with daylight exposure. Given that Neanderthals have adapted and lived for more than 200,000 years in northern parts of Europe and Eurasia, it seems reasonable to expect adaptation to lower UV levels and sunlight duration in then compared with modern humans ultimately coming out of Africa. There is a physical evidence to support this as well. So if uh, we plot 
size of the eye orbit and eye volume of Neanderthals compare them with contemporary modern humans living in Africa and lower latitudes, we find a significant differences. Neanderthals have larger eye sockets, probably to compensate for lower light levels in uh, northern latitudes and the long periods of winter darkness. There were several other phenotypes detected in the biobank data, which were also significantly linked with archaic alleles. One of those was mood. Another was the frequency of being uh, unenthusiastic or disinterested in the past two weeks. A third, loneliness and feeling of isolation. I wonder whether, like chronotypes, hair and skin tone, the degree of light exposure is a key factor in those mood-related behaviors, hence the Neanderthal link. Neanderthal genetic interrogation may also have been negative impacts on modern human uh, carriers today. Research has shown that genetic variants linked to lupus, biliary cirrhosis, Crohn's disease are derived from Neanderthals too. One of the risk haplotypes of, for the type 2 diabetes was also admixed from Neanderthals. People who carry the higher risk mutations are 25% more likely to have type 2 diabetes compared with those who don't. This doesn't mean that Neanderthals had a higher tendency to have diabetes for those genes may function differently in our modern genomes and modern environment. We call this, quote, acceptation, end quote, referring to functions acquired in this case genetically, for which they were not originally adapted or selected. In the past, it may well have been advantages to have the ability to store sugars in periods of nutritional stress or starvation, for example. This would have been adaptively advantages, but now it is a reverse because in the West, we often have oversupply of sugars in our diet. Initially, it seemed that selection over time reduced our Neanderthal ancestry from higher levels close to the date of introgression inter down to 1.1-2.5% we have today. Recent work, however, has suggested that this reduction in fact happened quite rapidly within 10 to 20 generations of interbreeding, and that following this, the proportion of Neanderthal DNA in non-African populations has stayed at a very similar level. Can we see the effects of Neanderthal intergression and admixture in living people today? I know I am probably not the only person to have wondered whether someone I know or have seen might be blessed with a teeny bit more Neanderthal than others, but is this really possible, or is it simply wishful thinking? Recent paleoanthropological studies have attempted to explore this question by combining genetics with high-resolution neuroimaging scans of living human skulls to study differences in endocranial shape. The inferred shape of a brain reconstructed from inside of the skull. We know already that the skulls of Neanderthals and modern humans are similar in size but have different shapes. Ours are more global, globular and bulge at the back and toward the front, while those Neanderthals are more elongated and flatter. A large study of 4,468 uh, living Europeans showed that variants introduced from Neanderthals near two genes 
did indeed have a subtle influence on the globular shape of their skulls. Intriguingly, the genes implicated are involved in part in the brain called the deep ganglia and may influence aspects of neural development, regions of the brain involved in memory, planning, movement, perhaps even speech and language too. We are only at the start of probing the functional aspects of genes and understanding what they do and how they work. In the future, using gene editing technologies, it might be possible to study the effects of presence and absence of certain alleles in stem cell cultures to work out what they do. In contrast to Nadertals, the UKB at the time of writing includes almost no one with intragressed Denisville ancestry. What we really need is detailed modern human genome and associated phenotype data from people living in places like New Guinea, Melanesia, the Philippines, Australia, populations in which we know there is a proportion of Denisovan DNA. Only when this is done will we truly be able to find out exactly what Denisovan DNA has contributed functionally to people who have inherited it. Nevertheless, there have been search in a generation of new genetic data from diverse population over recent years, which is slowly enabling more exploratory work to be undertaken on aspects of our inherited Denisovan genetic legacy. In 2016, 300 new genomes from 142 different populations were reported by Simon's Genome Diversity Project. SGDP, a project funded by Simons Foundation, the U.S. Charitable Trust. Previously, unidentified human DNA sequences highlighted the incomplete nature of breadth of our genetic diversity. New, never-before-seen DNA sequences from uh, Hoi Son of uh, uh, Southern Africa and from New Guinea, for example, added 11% and 5% respectively to a database of human genetic variation. This allowed a more detailed world map of the proportions of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in living humans to be constructed, showing that some groups of people living in South Asia have Denisovan ancestry. This was discovered only because of the new genetic data being obtained from people in the uh, subcontinent. Interestingly, SGDP dataset showed again that people in the east of Asia have a higher proportion of Neanderthal DNA than those in the west. This is the opposite of what we would expect, of course, given that we know Neanderthals were mainly concentrated in the West Eurasia. Why would Eastern Asians inherit slightly more Neanderthal DNA? In 2020, the answer to this conundrum came from new research on modern human DNA in Africa, which takes uh, account of the fact that there is a small amount of Neanderthal DNA in many living Africans derived from the movement of West Eurasian people with Neanderthal DNA back into the continent. When this DNA is taken into account and subtracted from the analysis, the proportion of Neanderthal DNA in the East and West Eurasia is much more similar. Once again, more genetic data from previously unsampled populations sheds a brighter light on our ancient past. We have already seen that modern humans expanded through uh, and into a range of diverse environments on their out of Africa journey. This included tropical and rainforest environment as well as so uh, near cave and other sites in Southeast and South Asia. Today, these are challenging environments for the 
for the consider. When I went to near to work, I had to ensure that I was properly vaccinated against typhoid, cholera, Japanese encephalitis, and of course malaria. Without this help, I would be reliant solely on my immune system to protect me. The response of our immune system to parasitical, bacterial, viral attack is crucial to our survival as species, and the genes that function to protect us are the result of evolutionary processes that have accumulated over millennia. Could the integration of advantages alleles from our archaic cousins have also helped in building up our own immune system? After all, if we are correct about there being a population of Denisovans living to east of uh, Wells Line, then we might expect that they have had time to build up immune responses to some of the diseases that lurk there. It turns out that the answer is empathic yes. Genes associated with immunity appear to be amongst the most positively selected genes introgressed to modern humans from our archaic cousins. And there are a lot of them. Around 400 gene variants inherited from Denisovans are concerned with either immunity or diet. What do they do? We are at the very start of working this out, but some interesting data are beginning to be published. One of the variants with the highest frequency in living Papuans so far identified is called TNF-AIP3. TNF-AIP3 codes for immune controller protein called A20. Natural polymorphism genetic variants of these genes are associated with overactive immunity in autoimmune conditions such as arthritis, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriasis. Researchers have identified that some variants of this gene increase inflammatory response, which might have be uh, how variants of TNF-AIP3 associate with autoimmune disease. In one case, a gene variant of TNF-AIP3 is one of those Denisovan introgress genes. The specific Denisovan variant of the gene called I207L involves a change in a single amino acid in A20 protein is a leucine to leucine, and this too is enough to produce a stronger inflammatory response in people with this variant compared to people without it. To test immune response of this particular gene, researchers took the variant, introduced it to mice, which they infected with virus called Coxsackie virus strain, a highly contagious hand, foot and mouth virus that strikes children at the age of five. Children go to bed at night feeling fine, but wake up in the morning with high temperature covered in bright red blisters. The mice with the I207L variant had significantly stronger immune reaction and resistant to the virus than those without it. The distribution of this variant in modern people is striking. People east of Wells Line have extremely high frequency, while those to the west have virtually none. TNF-AIP3 may have been positively selected in humans after intragression from Denison because of the added protection is conferred to unusual tropical microbes. When immune cells from people with the I207L variant were tested, they showed increased immune reaction. Increased immune reactivity may act to protect people from agents of disease such as microbes. 
in Ireland, South and Southeast Asia and Acania, between 25 and 75 percent of people are carriers. Elsewhere in the world, there are none. Interestingly, I-207L variant was also found in Denisovan girl from Altai, Denisova III, suggesting that it must date prior to separation of the various Denisovan population in East Asia and after the split from Neanderthals, since the Neanderthal genomes from Denisova cave do not have it. A recent study of DNA from near Oceanian people show several important structural deletions in genes that are central to detecting viruses and regulating the ability of the body to fire antiviral immune responses. Increasingly, one begins to realize that those genetic differences will be of great importance to modern uh, medicine. On the one hand, this knowledge enables us to understand more about how different groups have developed the ability to fight diseases, and on the other, it will help us to, uh, in future to provide targeted medical care to people from different backgrounds. The introgression of Denisovan DNA has also been linked with understanding how it is that Tibetans are adapted to coping with life at high altitude, where there is 40% less air than at sea level. Some of these adaptations concern newborn babies who weigh less on average than babies in lower attitudes. For every 1,000 meter of increasing altitude, newborn weights reduce by on average 100 gram. They also have lower levels of hemoglobin in their blood. Lower levels of hemoglobin in the blood seem strange because then people not habituated to living in altitude go to higher elevation, they acclimatize by slowly increasing the level of blood hemoglobin. In the case of Tibetan, however, they have a lower level, probably because increasing hemoglobin levels carry associated risks due to elevated blood viscosity and cardiac problems, including possible cardiac arrest. So they also have levels of lower levels of hemoglobin in their blood with higher uh, arterial oxygen saturation at birth and early life than uh, Han, Chinese babies living at the same altitude. This is thought to be a response to hypoxia. When part of the body fails to get enough oxygen to operate properly, this suggests that there has probably been selection going on in uh, Tibetans for genes that enable them to cope better with higher altitudes. The key gene in this case is called EPAS1. All human populations carry EPAS1, but in the case of Tibetans, the gene has a specific variant that produces protein that provides the bearer with hypoxia response and the ability to live more readily at altitude. To explore the genetic aspects of this adaptation, Tim sequenced the exomes of group of Tibetan villagers. Exomes are the genes that play the key role in directing protein production. The team was led by Emilia Huerta Sanchez, now in Brown University. They focused on the specific uh, section of EPAS1 gene and found that SNPs in the Tibetan version of the gene had distinct pattern when compared against a group of Han Chinese people and a group of Danes, both of course habituated to much less rarefied air. But how did Tibetans obtain this particular gene variant? 
Was it the result of mutation or was it derived from somewhere, somewhere else? The close genetic similarity between Han and Tibetans made it very risky a uh, problem to solve. Despite their close genetic relationship, EPAS1 has a 78% difference in expression between Tibetan and Han Chinese. So it's clearly important for people at altitude. Despite the evidently strong selection for the gene, it was impossible to distinguish the road by which it had become so dominant in the Tibetan genomes. The team looked into data from 1000 Genome Project to see whether the gene sequence in Tibetans might have come from another human population. But nothing like Tibetan version of the EPAS1 gene was evident in the entire dataset except in the two Chinese people. Strange, because once again Han Chinese are very closely related to Tibetans genetically. Then they checked against the newly available high coverage Neanderthal genome. Nothing there either. There was only one human genome left in the world to check against, the Denisovan genome. And suddenly there it was in the high coverage genome of Denisova girl, three girl an identical set of haplotypes. The DNA had come to Tibetans from Denisovans. Immediately, it all made sense. As uh, with other uh, modern humans interbreeding with Denisovans introduced DNA, including the section surrounding the EPS1 gene at some point at Eastern Asia. The Tianyan Ming uh, genome showed us that this probably happened some time before he lived. You will recall he was dated uh, 40,000 years ago. Han Chinese and Tibetan people share remarkably similar levels of Denisovan DNA, 0.4%, which suggests that it's likely that the in integration from Denisovans come into their ancestral population rather than later into the Tibetans only. Then descendants of these modern humans began to settle in the Tibet plateau. The EPS1 variant started to sweep through the population because it was highly advantageous. This is another level example of what is called, quote, adaptive introgression, end quote, where populations benefit from advantages in regress DNA. Interestingly, we see the same pattern in the region's animals, which also all have EPAS1. The Tibetan Mastiff, for example, owes its ability to survive at high altitude on the Tibetan plateau to introgression from gray valves that were already living there. Tibetan cattle derived a hypoxia, hypoxia related gene variant to help them cope with altitude by interbreeding with local yaks, from whom they derived just 1.2% of their genome. It seems Every animal is in the game of taking advantage of prior adaptation through genetic admixture. Humans are no exception. The, disco the discovery of EPAS1 in Tibetans immediately reminds me of the Denisovan jawbone from Baishe Karst Cave in Xiahe that we met in previous chapter. It is tempting to wonder whether Denisovans living on a Tibet plateau might have interbred with humans there, and that perhaps this was where the advantages variant originally appeared. We know now that modern humans have been 
living. On the Tibetan plateau since as early as 40,000 years ago, based on a new evidence from archaeological site called uh, Nvia Devu. This is a 4,600 meter above sea level and is the interior of the Tibetan plateau. This tells us that humans have been here at least since these times, and perhaps earlier. Like mastiffs and cattle, perhaps the Tibetan plateau was the place where this beneficial gene variant came into arriving modern human populations. Denisovan integration can also help us to explain aspects of the lifestyle and adaptation of the Greenland Inuit. To explore genes linked with adaptation to life in extreme Arctic conditions, researchers explored the genomes of Greenlanders to find genes that had higher levels of positive selection in that population. One of the most positively selected signals in the Inuits studied comprised two genes called WARS2 and TBX15. These are linked with body fats and body fat distribution, in particular to a type of fat called brown fat. This is common in newborn children where it enables the bearer to generate heat by burning calories. The TBX15 influences the body's reaction to cold climatic conditions. It seems unsurprising that one see this gene selected positively in an environment like Greenland. Almost 100% of Inuit have those genetic variants compared with other populations. <clears throat> Interestingly, these genes are highly, quote, pleiotropic, unquote, which means that they are associated with a variety of other types of traits. These include ear shape, stature, hair pigmentation, facial morphology, and fat distribution. The sequences in Greenland Inuit are most closely related to this from high coverage genome of the Denisova free girl, suggesting strongly that her population is where they originate and integrated from. We have learned substantial amounts from studies that explore and interrogate the genomes of modern people. We have seen that interbreeding has introduced genetic variants that were advantages to people in certain environments and are therefore present at high frequency in these populations. We have also seen that other genetic variants derived via Neanderthals have introduced the potential for certain people to have greater susceptibility to illnesses such as type 2 diabetes and lupus. It is clear then that there are both positive and negative aspects to our legacy of genetic interaggression. What is really exciting is that this genetic detective work is only just beginning. Over the next few years, we can expect many more revelations about modern health and how our genes both derived and ancestral, make us who we are today. We completed reading of the chapter Our Genetic Legacy from the book The World Before Us by Tom Hyam. <laughs>